Day three of Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial ended with not only a seated jury, but also an interesting exchange. Just a few minutes ago, we got a transcript of today's proceedings, and here is how that interesting exchange went. Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, says, I would ask that the people, meaning the prosecution, provide us, the defense, with the names of their first three witnesses so that we can prepare. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass. Look, I, I got to be honest. That's a courtesy that we normally extend. Mr. Trump has been tweeting about the witnesses. We're not telling who the witnesses are. Judge Mershon. I can't fault the people for that, Mr. Blanche. What if I commit to the court and the people that President Trump will not tweet about any witness? Judge Mershon not buying it and saying to Trump's lawyer, I don't think you can make that representation. They won't give it to you today or tomorrow, and they're not required to. Boom. The concern over witness safety is part of a broader concern here about Donald Trump's outbursts. Earlier today in court, prosecutors asked Judge Mershon to hold Trump in contempt for seven problematic social media posts he has made since the trial began on Monday. And that is on top of the other problematic posts Trump made earlier that the prosecution says violate his current gag order. Joining me now is Andrea Bernstein, journalist covering Trump and legal matters for National Public Radio, NPR, and author of American Oligarchs, The Kushners, The Trumps, and The Marriage of Money and Power. And of course, back with me is Jeremy Saland. It's great to have you both here. Um, Andrea, I, I'm curious to hear uh, your assessment of this. It really feels like we talked about the intersection between candidate Trump and defendant Trump. And here, candidate Trump's outbursts and, you know, sort of weaponization of the jurors and the trial and the witnesses is really redounding not to his benefit here, right? Like, the, the prosecutor, the defense is not going to get the names of the first three witnesses because nobody trusts them to keep it yes. under their hat. Yes, that was a surprise. And, I mean, I, look, we all know who the witnesses are going to be here. It's a huge surprise. It's just a question of order and strategy. But there was Judge Juan Mershon saying directly... I don't trust you to keep your mouth shut or your fingers off your keyboard. So therefore, you don't get this list. You've lost that privilege. And already, I mean, on the first day of the trial, when he said to Trump, writes that he reads to everybody. But it really mm -hmm. resounded when he said, if you disrupt the proceedings, you can be expelled and I can send you to jail. Right. Because in all of the other trials that I have covered of Trump that he has attended. He has disrupted the proceedings. He's had interactions with the judge. He's muttered in front of the jury. I mean, he's spoken, I should say, audibly in front of the jury. I could hear him. They could hear him. And he stood up and gave his own closing arguments in the fraud trial after he had been told directly by the judge, you can't do that. Right. So when Rasham says that, he has the weight of history behind him in that judgment. I mean, I, I also think that it, it betrays the well, like, should we call it a fractured relationship between T Trump and his lawyers? Like, his lawyers are out there saying, well, what if we promise you our client isn't going to tweet about this? And or we're just going to keep it amongst ourselves. And the judge is effectively saying, like, you have no basis for saying that. You have no control over your client. They, they can't make that promise. And just to be very clear, the, the court is not, or part of me, Josh Steinglass is not saying, I'm not going to give you the witness's name and information. That's already been turned over. Mm -hmm. To your point, it's just the order of who's being called. And in normal course of things with a very cordial relationship, that's shared. But to your point again, he is undeserving, meaning Donald Trump, to act as he is acting to get that information. I mean, and I, I would assume, just in, by way of preparation, it's good to have the information, even if you know who they're going to be. The order of things right. is not insignificant. But you also expect that you're prepared for all those witnesses, whoever they come. Sure. But you, you, it would be very helpful, unequivocally so. And also, this happening day one, it doesn't exactly set the stage for, I don't know, a cordial working relationship between the two. I mean, it is an adversarial process, Andrea. But you, you point out the way in which Trump is incapable of censoring himself or exhibiting self-control. And I wonder if you think the duration of this trial, the fact that he has to be there every day, you can tell us what it's like inside that courtroom, but it doesn't sound like a trip to Disneyland. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously unhappy. I mean, I think that one of the things that happened in the course of the other trials was that he figured out a way to make it redound to his benefit. This trial, he is going to be listening to testimony about an extramarital affair that he had in 2006 and a hush money payment, stuff that is much clearer to the public than he overvalued or he undervalued his assets or how much is Mar-a-Lago worth anyway. Everybody knows what having an affair means and everybody knows what a porn star is and everybody knows what a playboy, playboy model is. Mm -hmm. And he has to sit there and listen to that 
day in, day out. I mean, when I was reporting previously and speaking to people who worked for him, they said he could barely sit in any single room for any period of time, that they were told when they gave him presentations to give him one word and three images. Right. And this is... I mean, long days in a very kind of cruddy and uncomfortable courtroom, which is either too hot or too cold and just, you know, a very far cry from Trump Tower. Well, and he made a point outside of the court today to talk about what a sham trial it was. He was armed with a stack of newspaper printouts or, or uh, post print, printouts of website uh, and Internet articles and complained about the temperature in the courtroom. This is someone whose self-control is going to have to extend not just to the court room itself, but after hours as well, right? I mean, the, the well, question here is... obviously what's at issue. And yeah. the, the gag order, I mean, I guess my question to you would be, what is your expectation about this gag, gag order? I mean, I he has really been challenged in following any of these gag orders. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I think Mershon has clearly shown that he is drawing the line, Judge Mershon, and that he is not going to accept it. So we shall see. I mean... As with everything else in this trial, we have no priors. Right. So we cannot say what is going to happen because we don't know one minute to the next, let alone one day to the next. All we know is that Trump has a really hard time. I mean, for example, after the, he was told to pay $83 million to Adrian right. Carroll, there was a period where he stopped saying, I didn't do it. And then he started again. And $83 million is quite a disincentive. Yes. So can he keep his mouth shut now? We shall see. What will it take? We will find out. Do you think a couple hours at Rikers is even in the cards? I mean, I hesitate to even say that because it seems so far-fetched. Well, the, the, first of all, number one, a contempt can be civil or criminal. And if it happens in front of the judge, the judge can summarily say you've committed contempt. If it happens outside, like the tweeting or true socialing, if that's a, a verb. True thing. Uh, true thing. Uh, then it's a separate actual hearing. He has a right to you know, challenge that. Uh, will the judge put him in for up to 30 days on Rikers Island? Uh, probably not. Could he sit, at, you know, cool his heels, uh, you know, uh, in the in the tombs behind? Maybe that's possible. A thousand dollar fine is really insignificant, but that, it's that exposure for most people who don't go to this point. But for most people, to know that I can go to jail for 30 days, and a judge can make that decision, and it's pretty serious. So, is it possible that he sits? Somewhere on the side there. In That's, an even colder room? Yeah, yeah. or even, even right there, there's benches he could sit. It's, it's certainly possible, but he's not going to go to Rikers. And he knows that. He knows that. So Stress testing the judicial system. That is where we are right now. Andrea Bernstein, Jeremy Saland, it's great to see you both. Thanks for your time and thoughts tonight. Great to talk to you. You support him for president, even if he's convicted in classified documents. You support him for president, even though you believe he contributed to an insurrection. You support him for president, even though you believe he's lying about the last election. You support him for president, even if he's convicted in the Manhattan case. I just want to say the answer to that is yes, correct? Yeah, me and 51% of America. You said it would be an honor to be offered a spot on his ticket. Really? Yeah, I think anyone who's offered the opportunity to serve this country as vice president should be honored. I think the country and the world was a better place when he was president. And, it w and I would love to see him return to the White House. That was New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu and Florida Senator Marco Rubio crowing about Donald Trump after spending quite a while criticizing him. Just a year ago, Governor Sununu wrote an op-ed in The Washington Post slamming Trump for peddling the conspiracy theory that he won the 2020 election and repelling independence. Senator Rubio, meanwhile, called Trump a con man and a fake tough guy. Rubio and Sununu are not alone, and they aren't even among the most egregious in their sudden change of heart. For that, you'd have to look towards former Attorney General Bill Barr. The same Bill Barr who said that Trump's actions on January 6th amounted to a grave wrongdoing. The same Bill Barr who called Trump a consummate narcissist. The same Bill Barr who predicted abuse of power if Trump were to be elected again. That Bill Barr has now endorsed Donald Trump. I will vote the Republican mm, ticket. You I will. will support the Republican ticket. I think the real danger to the country, the real danger to democracy, as I say, is the progressive agenda. And uh, while Trump, and I said, uh, Trump may be uh, playing Russian roulette, but uh, continuation of the Biden administration is national suicide, in my opinion. Joining me now is McKay Coppin, staff writer at The Atlantic. McKay, I, I do wonder, what is your reaction to this, this, this Bill Barr endorsement of Donald Trump after all that we have heard from the man in the course of the last several years? 
It's interesting, right? Because, you know, some of the other clips you showed, Chris Sununu, Marco Rubio, these are Republican politicians who still want to have a future in Republican politics. And so you can kind of understand the craven calculation that they're making, which is, you know, Donald Trump is the leader of our party. He's the most popular Republican in our party. I have to be aligned with him, regardless of what I think, if I want to keep having a job. Bill Barr is a curious case because, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know what future he has at this point in the party, right? He's not going to run for office. It's unlikely that he would certainly return to a Trump administration. Trump hates him. So what is he doing here? And, you know, I've spent a lot of time writing about, reporting on, thinking about the psychology of these Republicans who understand who Trump is and the threat that he poses and still find themselves supporting him. And I think it, it, it's important to understand that it's not always just a simple case of cowardice. I mean, cowardice is kind of woven into the calculation, but it's also you know, it, it's something more complicated. I remember talking to Mitt Romney about this, uh, the Utah senator, and he said, you know, when you're as entrenched in a political party uh, as, as somebody like Bill Barr is, as somebody like Mitt Romney is, you've spent decades making friends, allies, raising money for, getting money from Republican institutions. It's really hard to disentangle yourself from that party apparatus. And turning on Trump in the year 2024, as it was true in 2020 and 2016, it, it, it kicks you out of that your whole social ecosystem. And I, I think that that's probably part of what's going on with all these Republicans that you just showed. I think that they just don't want to be people without a party. And so they, they kowtow to Trump, even though they know how dangerous he is. I was, I, yeah, I, that's such a, a, a brilliant explanation for it, McKay, a very deeply thoughtful one. But I was also struck by the fact that Bill Barr calls a vote for Biden a vote for national suicide. And I wonder from your conversations with Republicans, what lies at the root of that indignation? This mm -hmm. idea that the progressive agenda is, is so suicidal that it trumps pardon the metaphor, what Bill Barr has outlined are a series of grave concerns about Donald Trump's leadership. I mean, do you have a sense of, of what, how Bill Barr justifies this in terms of the others, uh, in terms of the Biden candidacy? So I don't know what Bill Barr's specific issue is. I think it varies depending on the Republican you talk to, right? So if you are a dyed-in-the-wall wool, uh, social conservative, for example, uh, you might believe that the trade-off in the judiciary, the Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade, things like that, are worth kind of making a deal with a kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> madman, the, the the way that they see Donald Trump as. If you're somebody who is a single issue voter, you're thinking about deregulation, maybe that's your issue. I, I don't know what Bill Barr's issue is, but I do think that he represents a, a real phenomenon, which is that I think the way that a lot of these Republicans get to the point where they can get back on board with Trump after saying that he's a threat to democracy, he's a threat to the constitutional order, uh, it is by kind of narrowing their view of this race uh, in a way that they think of it as a traditional partisan, you know, party politics election, right? It's a Democrat and a Republican, mm. and and I disagree with the Democrats. And, you know, everything else aside, uh, the Democratic agenda is bad. And, and I've spent my entire life, my entire career built around that idea that the Democratic agenda is evil, it's bad, uh, and it's bad for the country. And, and I think that they, they kind of rationalize their way into supporting Donald Trump because because they, they go back to thinking about this election as a kind of traditional election. Yeah. Uh, like uh, the elections you had in the 90s or the 80s, right? But it's, but it's not that at all, right? I mean, they may rationalize mm -hmm. it. The Republican Party, as it is, it, let's look at Congress, where Mike Johnson is facing ouster for bringing forth a Ukraine funding bill, which in the 90s would have been a no-brainer for the Republican Party. I mean, Trump has just right. made the party about him, and fealty and loyalty to Trump get you nothing. Mike Johnson was down in Mar-a-Lago kissing the ring last week, and this today, Donald Trump really does have an opinion on whether Mike Johnson deserves to keep his job. Is that not a cautionary tale for any of these Republicans? Yeah. It's such a good point, and it's the thing that I, I constantly am bringing up when I, I talk to Republican leaders, because effectively the deal that Donald Trump has offered Republican politicians is you swear to me your absolute, unvarnished, abject loyalty, often in humiliating ways, and in return I offer you nothing. 
right? Yes. <laughs> Trump offers no loyalty. There's no, time and time again, he has betrayed, humiliated, ousted, gotten rid of, ended the careers of Republicans who have humiliated themselves sucking up to him. And, and you would think we're almost a decade into this phenomenon. You would think by now Republicans would understand that they have no protection, right? But that at the same time, I think that the calculation a lot of them are making is that Donald Trump might not guarantee me anything, but the voters that, that, that elect me love Donald Trump. And at the very least, if I'm on board with him, they won't revolt against me right away. And I, I really think that's the calculation most of them are making. Again, I don't see how that applies to Bill Barr, who is not running for anything. And I, I would like to see more reporting on, on what led him to this decision. Yeah, me too. He's not running for anything. The policy doesn't exist and the loyalty is non-existent. OK, Bill. McKay Coppins, <laughs> thank you for your time, my friend. It's great to see you as always. Thanks, Alex. Whenever Donald Trump decides he doesn't want to commit to something, whenever he wants to punt on a question about something within his control, he always says the same thing. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So we'll see what happens. But we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. See what happens. We'll see what happens. So we'll see what happens. We're going to see what happens. But we'll see. But we'll see. The end result is we'll see. We'll see what happens. This week, Donald Trump added the fate of House Speaker Mike Johnson to the list of things where he'll just wait and see what happens. Mr. President, are you going to Speaker Johnson? Well, we'll see what happens with that. I think he's a very good... Did he brief you on his plan to do four separate foreign aid bills? Mike Johnson is in trouble. Right now, the Speaker of the House appears to be moving forward with a plan to allow a standalone vote on aid to Ukraine, which has made House conservatives absolutely furious. Some of them are ready to kick Mike Johnson out of the job the same way they ousted Speaker Kevin McCarthy just six months ago. And Mike Johnson is running out of options to save himself. At the beginning of the day, as in today, there were rumblings that Johnson might try to change House rules in order to make it harder for conservatives to oust him. That proposal, unsurprisingly, outraged conservatives who confronted the speaker on the House floor. CNN reports that Johnson was essentially pinned against the back wall of the House floor with members on all sides of him with the speaker constantly pivoting his head as he responded to members speaking to him. Sounds hectic. If that congressional bullying circle wasn't sufficient to get Johnson in line, conservative members also put together a team to monitor the House floor to make sure that neither Johnson or his allies introduced a measure to change the rules on them. And they called themselves the Floor Action Response Team. F-A-R-T. Fart. Yes, that is really what they call themselves. Fart. But you have to take them seriously, even though they call themselves fart. Because all day long, these conservatives were telling any reporter who would listen that they were not happy with Speaker Johnson and that they would not abide any changes to these rules. Our goal is to avoid a motion to vacate, but we are not going to surrender that accountability tool, particularly in a time when we're seeing America's interests subjugated to foreign interests abroad. He's serving Ukraine first and America last. You have our own border that's open, and yet the funding would actually be going to securing Ukraine border beforehand, which is simply not acceptable. By the end of the day, Mike Johnson caved to the FARC caucus. In a statement on X, he announced that he would not change the rules for ousting a speaker, a.k.a. himself, saying we will continue to govern under the existing rules. So Speaker Mike Johnson has zero protection right now. He cannot change the rules to stop conservative members from kicking him out of office. And the only person who can protect him here, Donald Trump, appears to be completely indifferent to Johnson's fate. That is what it means to be a Republican these days. Give Donald Trump your undying loyalty, knowing that Trump may throw you under the bus whenever it suits him. Got to just wait and see what happens.
Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.